Hello everyone and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I'm speaking with Richard Scholes. We're here in his shed of wonders to have a look at what he's been making recently. I thought it'd be very interesting to talk to Richard because he has quite a long practice uh, in as far as making all sorts of very interesting art creations that span a lot of different media. So Richard, what was it that first got you started taking photographs or making all the objects and costumes for them? Ooh. I can I can tell you that actually. Um, as a wee lad I used to draw. Illustration was what I considered art to be pen and paper because that's all I could afford. But my family were big into photography but photography for them was documenting things. So for example my mother took slide photos when she toured around the Middle East and, and so it was about you document buildings and parties and but it wasn't art and so I did art and I had a camera and then I discovered somewhere in the 90s going out and wearing ridiculous costumes and going to like golf gigs. Oh yeah I'm familiar with that. Indeed. Yeah. And so then I discovered the joys of dress up and so then you have people dressing up in wonderful costumes and then someone goes oh well could you take a photo of my costume before we go out and you take a photo but that is a record of the costume it's not a, an art photo mm. but then once upon a time 1999 um, October uh, a young lady by the name of Helen had bought herself her first gothic skirt and it was a black PVC skirt with little rocket spikes and she got it from Wild Bear and she was like oh I'm gonna wear it out and I'm gonna look very cool and she did and she said could you take a photograph and at that time being an annoying early 20s goth lad myself or goth adjacent I had black bin liners stapled on one of the walls of my bedroom in this terrible flat that I lived in uh, and so instead of just having her standing in the hallway and go, meh, I said, if you sit on the bed, then we'll have the shiny black background oh, behind you. Beautiful. Took the photograph. So that is technically the first time I took a photograph in which I kind of tried to con you know, control the subject, the location, and give direction. And then people saw that photo and went, oh, yes, could we do more of that? So, and I was like, well, okay. So then it came, instead of just like taking a snapshot before you go out the door, people were like, oh, if I get dressed up early, we can take some nice photographs. And so we started, sort of and it just evolved from there really yeah. you had so, uh, some days you'd be like well instead of just um getting ready to go out and then take photos of that it'd be like well how about another day we just take photographs of these cool costumes and then you start saying well what if we make something that's not necessarily able to go out and and that's where this stuff comes about really this at a certain point although the i claim these are all wearable costumes to go out and at a certain point <laughs> they got less wearable. They got less wearable. <laughs> uh, certainly some of them can't leave the shed. The most recent one I made, can't, I can't actually put it on. It, um, I accidentally sealed it onto the mannequin it was built on. So it's not even a costume anymore. Is it looks the, like is it. Is that the Big Brother one? The Big Brother is now just technically a sculpture. And, and that's really sort of the, the evolution was that uh, people it had gone from um, just documenting other people's costumes to sort of directing people to, well, we could do more with that and then you just I discovered computers this is all done on film this is all done in a dark room um, all very black and white and moody uh, but then I discovered digital photography and I could work in color and then I discovered that layers and then I discovered that you could put drawings onto pictures and then you can print them and then you can vandalize them and then you can print them again and you can do and it becomes a sort of cyclic ad, ad, ad absurd ad absurdium I don't know yes <laughs> for me I actually used to have a chip on my shoulder I never studied art I, yeah. I I liked drawing because I liked I liked drawings, yeah. and so I would do cartooning, and I worked for the university magazines and things like that, doing you know silly cartoons, and and so I I, I, I had this chip on my shoulder. I was like, I'm not an you know, I had an idea what an artist was yeah, and yeah, what yeah. I was. Yeah, yeah. Never the twain shall meet, and so even after I did my first exhibition, I didn't like the term artist because this everything I do the reason and, and, and the reason I do it in this form it is just an extension of having a few drinks with your mates before going out and taking some photos and having a laugh and that element has never left the work I've I've done grander projects I've done mm. more complicated things but the, at its core it is still having a laugh with my mates and so I've never felt that there was any restriction on on what I could and couldn't do um, that other than the, the only restriction is the one I put on myself which sometimes I, I, I undercut and, and I sabotage my own work you know I'll phone a joke just to go oh we'll see no no one's taking this too seriously 
And what's interesting is that's a very art thing to do though, to actually get look at your own restrictions on your work and almost sabotage them hmm. in order to get something different. Well, I mean the 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 only like serious art piece I ever did, I did spent two years making my own deck of tarot cards and yeah. that was my way of processing with some sadness in my life and I felt I needed to put in the project and and I came up with this whole thing and it was serious and it was impressive and it was important and it, probably 50 of my friends gave their time yeah. towards it and it was awesome and it had a big exhibition and I called the deck the Charybdis Tarot which sounded cool but Charybdis is the goddamn whirlpool from the Odyssey because the joke is that work sucked and so I had to have that little thing and I didn't you, didn't you, make a joke you, about you've it. You've got to have that little, that yeah. little self-deprecation. It was, it, was, it was almost like an out. It's like, oh, yeah. I'm not taking this too seriously. Yeah. There, there was my little sort of ejection handle, just in case someone accused me of, of taking myself too seriously. I was like, ha, no, no, I don't. But all that work that you did, that you know, you were saying it was like yourself processing some sadness and wanting to create a, a project, really impacted a lot of other people as well, because all of the people that became involved in that work, it gave them something as well. Like it wasn't just you, it mm. suddenly pulled in you know, these 50 other people where the work became very important to them too. Which oddly enough is, is one of the reasons I had to finish the project because I was relying on the, um, on the, the, the kindness of my friends and putting them in some terribly awkward positions. <laughs> um, and so there, there had to be a payoff in, in my mind and, uh, and, and that more so than anything else drove me forward to actually you know, take it seriously. I, 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 it was one thing to take the mickey out of myself, but I couldn't take the mickey out of everyone else. Well, exactly. Once they've put all that work in, mm. it's, it's kind of the same with what I do. Like, you know, I, mm. I can't let all the, pe the models and the people who've been in my work down mm. by not producing something yeah. cool that they can see as well. Yeah. So, which is why one of the reasons I've, I've um, that was almost a pressure I put on myself, which I didn't need all the time. So the reason my work is kind of scaled back and I'm doing a lot more in the form of sculpture and mm. costumes that are never going to be worn is that removes any obligation in the work because at a certain point I didn't want to let people down but to avoid that I've also gone in a different direction yeah. um, so that if by chance it, it's, it's not isolating myself, I'm not walling myself off from anyone, but I'm making the things first. The things are important to themselves because you make a prop for a photo, that prop doesn't become itself until it's in the photo. Yeah, and yeah. the, photo the object doesn't gain its life, it doesn't become a, an alive thing or a performing thing until it's actually... Exactly, if you, if you make something for a purpose and it doesn't achieve its purpose, it never fully became. No. So I'm yeah. making things that are things for the sake of things, that if they can then be used, um, then that's, that's a bonus. And a lot of the stuff will and you get used, especially come summer when it's a bit warmer. Uh, but without... Once I took the pressure off, because a lot of times with costuming, you are thinking about, I mean, this is, you can see this ridiculous clutter. Um, and this is what I like. I like a density of ideas. I like an mm. identity of, 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 of imagery. So you work your ass off on a, on a particular prop or whatever you're making. It's, the effort you put into it is not going to be seen in the photo. So you have to decide, is it worth putting in all the effort knowing that the effort won't be seen mm. or do you kind of cheap out, do it just so it's a prop for the photo and do the bare minimum? And now I've taken off the restriction on myself to make that judgment. I'm like, make the best thing you can and it's the thing itself that matters. Yeah. So I will put in the effort, I will go the extra yard, I will put in details that no one else is ever going to see, and I am freaking loving it. That's that's really the... Yeah, that's that's cool. beautiful. That's, yeah. That, yeah, that's it's, This is done to amuse myself. I mean, I forget the jokes and the, the silly little things that I put into the stuff, and I actually get to impress myself. That is mm. the one challenge I think that, I, you know, why do I do what I do? Sometimes I actually impress myself, and I go, like, well, Past Richard, that was uh, he was having a bit of a laugh there. <laughs> it's awesome. It's um, it's interesting um, for me because in my process with making objects and costumes and things to go into photographic or video works, I love that part. Like that mm -hmm. part just is so delicious and enjoyable. And then once I get the video and the photos back working on them, that is also incredibly enjoyable. But I find the part 
where I'm actually filming really, really stressful and uncomfortable. Mm. Do you do you get that at all? Well, yes, the, 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 there's the one point, there's, um, there's all the control in the setup. There's all the control in the processing. Mm. But it makes me think of screen printing. Because um, I used to cut screen prints, mm. um, which the punks taught me. And so you get your razor blade wrapped in sellotape and you'd, you'd spend like a week cutting out this big picture. And you have all the control and you can make all the changes and do it perfectly. But then, paint, scoop, and in those three seconds... You don't know what you're getting. Yeah, you can screw it up or not. And yeah. the, ch the, the moment is gone, and especially when I was first shooting on film. You didn't even have a chance to look at the, um, the, 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 the footage. You guessed. And, and so when I was doing like location work, I remember I, I shot one thing. It was out on location, um, some young lady giving it the beans, really. You know, showing off, a, 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 really you know, performing. It was great. It was wonderful. I had left a night for it was it was an internal light filter on my camera. These blue filters you used to put on to take out the blue tint you got from flashes to try and give everything a slightly warmer glow. But I was shooting outdoors, so everything came out with a blue hint. And, I, and, and at the time I was like, nah! and then I look at me, oh, actually this is really spooky and cool. So it's very cool. That's when I started learning about coke and filters and, and filtering film. But yeah, we'd, we'd located and scouted, we'd planned everything, we'd done everything, and I just had missed that little, um, that little lens mm. and found out afterwards, because, and then the moment was gone. And so, that can be stressful, but I've minimized the stress by working in a safe space for me. That means um, it's, it, it's, it's safe to experiment and we can take a pause because no one's on the clock. I'm working with friends, they understand me. Yeah. And so if I yeah. go, hang on, I've got yeah. an idea, this isn't working, let's try and change something. And you can imagine that, but also it's great for collaboration because someone might be going, oh, I'm not really feeling it. Because when I shoot, I always have a mirror in front of the camera so the person being photo uh, photographed can see what's going on. And they might be like, oh, I don't like this, or what about this, and try this. And, um, and, and so this space allows us to collaborate and take that pause. And so that took all the fear out of photography, out of that, that one one sixtieth of a second that used to really be nerve wracking. And um, so, yeah, I've, that, that, that's been my cure. And, and it's a compromise. You can't, um, you know, you, I, I'm putting incredible restriction on myself using a small space. Mm. Uh, this is, it is pokey. This is a space in which you can have a person, a, you can have a subject and a photographer. You can't even have an assistant in here, to be honest. But it does mean it's, you can experiment more. Yeah, that's, that's really relevant. And it's interesting because when I, made my first video, which was behind the scenes at one of my shows. I actually talked about you and about the difference between myself shooting in um, you know, a, a borrowed or rented studio space and you mm. having a space that you like to shoot in mm. and the kind of pressure that I feel on myself uh, to not let anyone down and not take too long mm. and not to be messing around too much and you know, not taking up the model's time. Whereas for you here, you managed to kind of get rid of that those mm. stresses. Yeah, yeah but, that but there, there is an incredible compromise there because you know, a studio space allows you the Oh yeah, well the, the I'm equipment. shooting, I've got just, yeah. yeah, whatever I want really. Yeah. And so, but also I have worked in studios. I mean, I, I, I when, when I was, when the, when, the, when the picture was the most important thing, there was a period in time in which it was, I wanted to make sure I was giving the best output possible. Because there are shortcuts and, and workarounds you have to do in this space. So I was like, okay, I have faith in an idea. I want this to be as good as possible. Let's use the professional equipment. I had a friend who was studying photography. I was able to get into this place in um, so Royal Oak, I think it was, he was, he was studying. So I got to use the, the, the proper equipment, yeah. the proper cameras, the proper lighting. And A, the picture didn't look that much better, and B, it actually looked kind of generic. Because yeah. I was following in someone else's mm. footsteps, because the bars were in the right place and the lights were in the right place, and you start going, well, when you're working in this space, it makes sense that you do what has been done before. And you start mm. seeing the markings on the floor, and you go, this, this will give me the the, 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 the perfect uh, yeah. photo that will capture all the nuance and everything. But it also looked like everyone else's. I, and so I'd have to take a lot of time to learn that space to try and give it a voice. This space is only my voice yeah. with limitations, whereas the other places are empty and 
yeah, the, the time you limit yourself to to work in, and and, and, and yeah, we, we, we've worked together, and you're sort of yeah, you get in there and you're 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 efficient and, just, and what have and you. There's nothing there, and you have to set everything up, and yeah. Yeah, and and that idea just uh, that that's no fun, mm. and I would rather. It's stressful. Yeah, I I don't think my output could, because I'm not doing anything for any any reason other than a bit of a giggle. I'm not doing work for anyone for any particular purpose. It doesn't have to have a professional sheen to it. Mm. Um, and if I was going to do something that needs to be, you know, large scale and fully printed, you're going to find out when you zoom in on, on photos taken here because it's quite dark and gloomy. So you're shooting up the IFSO, the, not IFSO, the ISO. Uh, so it's getting grainier and yeah. such forth. And you'll find there's lots of you know, weird mistakes and all that sort of stuff. So you, I would potentially do it more professionally if I had to, but at the moment, don't have but to. But then again, like when you're sort of talking about, you know, the professionality of it and the way it started to look like you know what you'd expect from a shoot mm. that's really more to do with commercial shooting yeah, commercial yeah. photography mm. whereas with you know making artwork uh, you can really do whatever you want mm. and there's a lot to be said about oh hello hello they gave me my wife's home. <laughs> there's a lot to be said about kind of interesting image that is not perfect or you know the poor mm. image or whatever like distorted image or mm multiply copied image or whatever there's a lot to be said for that yeah. oh yeah but which is uh, I suppose I, I I'm doing what I enjoy but if for example yeah, you mentioned commercial stuff a lot of what I do has uh, a, it's almost it is it is like a faux commercial thing so much of what I'm making are almost I imagine them because so much of the inspiration comes from pop culture these are almost like the props and elements to a film that's never been made. Ah, um, yeah. And so there was always an idea that if I was wanting to show off the works as sculptures or whatever, or as models or whatever, you would photograph them more correctly. Um, but at the moment I take great glee in putting all this effort into stuff. I mean, the uh, yeah, you, I mentioned the Big Daddy one, there's the, uh, the Mad Scientist costume. That was, a, I, I spent a good month and you know, a, a bit of money, but mostly just time and patience, making this ridiculously big costume, put a beautiful woman in it, took three photographs, you can't recognise it as a person at, at all because <laughs> the costume is so restrictive, the fact is the only difference between a person and a mannequin is they could do this motion and that was it, they couldn't even do this. And took they loved photos. wearing it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Chucked a photograph on Instagram, went bish, bash, bosh, done. And that is a delight. I take yeah. great glee in, in, in not taking this stuff seriously and, and not being professional. So we were talking about, well I was talking about how I um, took a very pretty lady and put her in a costume which you couldn't recognise that there was a pretty lady inside, um, which was this thing which was just, I suppose, inspired by um, things like the House on Haunted Hill or Reanimator, you know, I, a good mad scientist thing. Um, and it all came about because I had a, um, a white pleather gimp mask, for reasons we won't go into, um, and I just had the idea of what it would take to make that into more of a, I don't know, grungy, steampunky, post-apocalyptic, who knows what adjectives you want to give, um, mad doctor costume. And so it's just a case of really trying to find elements that works so I found an old dental gag and I've got a bit of a necklace there and some rubber tubing and that's a tea strainer and some old scissors and um, that's a shower curtain uh, sorry shower not a shower curtain shower hose and scraps of wire and I had some Tokyo ghoul mask and don't ask me why, but I had a gold um, U-bend to go under a sink, and so I sort of went, yeah. <laughs> Why did you have a gold U-bend? Because I saw it, it was shiny in a shop, and I went, I will find a use, and it had been <laughs> hanging somewhere for a while, I went, I found the thing, That's and awesome. so I want, I like the idea of this having this sort of a mad sort of a alien proboscis, and I was like, well, I found a, a ring, and, and a syringe, and a broken toy, and some hoses, and some eyelets, and some bits of leather, and paracord and tubing and this threw everything into the mix and you get this sort of slightly odd I mean I had an old stethoscope and I had a bunch of um, I swear false teeth uh, to just to, just finding things to, to add to it to give it um, a slightly unnerving air and when you get close to it you can see these are all reasonably normal things I just like the fact that there was a sort of combining them in a way that made everything look just a little bit um, peculiar But as far as that, you know, the, the screen printing mm. analogy, when you don't know what you're going to get, I'm absolutely excited about 
doing burst photography at the oh. moment and then you don't know what you're going to get and mm. you end up you'll shoot like 50 shots and you'll end up with one that's just unbelievably amazing i just i can't do it in my my, my, my first exhibition 80 pieces and i did i could afford two rolls of film per yeah, shot that's the difference with digital isn't yeah. it I, and i've fun. never quite because i i was only in my 30s when I got a digital camera and I'm still thinking that every shot is precious yeah uh, it's hard to get past that yeah and so when I first got a camera that had a motor drive and I loved holding down the button and yeah, 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 it's like yeah. this is great but uh, yeah it, 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 it I suppose there's a point that I you know I, I'm the only person who matters to what I consider to be real and false and what have you my, and my in my opinion that's cheating because in my mm. opinion I am using technology to get something and i i am always fearful when like i do a photograph of our friends and, and now, nowadays i will shoot over a hundred shots uh, but also oftentimes we go on a bit of an adventure so we're, we're not aiming for one particular image you might go oh we can do a range of images and so maybe to get half a dozen great photos and different styles we'll take 200 photos yeah but then they say oh can i see the rest and i'm like no, no if you see no. the rest you'll understand that this is utterly luck that, that there's a good photo that it's out of a hundred photos well, one is with, lucky with a burst shoot it's exactly the same hmm. because i for one set of photos i did like we shot like a thousand pictures and i think i ended up with five that i really liked um so there's that very much that luck element and i as far as cheating i would consider it cheating if i photoshopped it ah yeah, yeah, yeah. so everything i do is in camera hmm not photoshop that's respect oh yeah yeah the, the the joy i get out of what i do is is managing to do everything in camera yeah even when i know i don't have to no and like i don't have to i'm a yeah. photoshop whiz i can do whatever i want <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah but, but, but that, that does that, that's the thing it, it's you know that, that removes the cheating element absolutely that you can look at something and go that was I did that, um, and even if it took me a hundred times, even so, you still you got that. You final got that result. thing exactly, yeah. and and it's that satisfaction and the fact mm. that that it's almost like a purity or something. Yeah. It's a purity of the image. That image happened at that very moment, mm. and I didn't have to do anything to change it yeah. or make it. And and coming from a film background, in which you know, my first exhibition I did by that point have a computer, and it's some. Terrible photoshopping, not to change the pictures, but to add elements and titles yeah, and stuff. Yeah, that's, that's a real sort of slippery slope, <coughs> isn't it? It's it is. Tricky. But up yeah. until that point, I had the darkroom, so if I wanted to dodge and burn, it's the piece of paper on yep. the wire. Yep, 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 yep. And I'm yeah. stacking, um, stacking negatives yes. inside the enlarger. Yes, yeah. exactly. Oh, and and so that. that's that that's where I, I learned, and and that was my happy place. That mm. because it's it is a tangible physical thing, because it came from illustration, and now I love making things that. And so the the photo, the image being the image itself, again being the thing itself, not the for yeah the, the, the precursor to a Photoshop. So it's it's not yeah you, you're photographing these just just for elements. And it's like I'll fix it in post. Yeah, I don't know. I don't like that either. Yeah. I don't want to do that. It's like I'll adjust lighting. I'll do a bit of color grading on video, but I don't want to do anything else. Mm. I want it to be as is. Oh, maybe what I will do is if there's a long strand of string or something <laughs> of this coming up, I'll get rid of that. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't like to do lots of lots and lots of post on my work either. Yeah. It's sort of just for me. I feel like it defeats the purpose of what I'm doing. Yeah. And that thing about making stuff, you know, people have said to me, "Oh, do you make your costumes?" I'm like, "Yeah," mm -hmm. because. If I wasn't able to make my costumes, I wouldn't actually do this mm. <laughs> because that's like a really integral part of it. Yeah. It's making all the things that go in it. Oh yeah, I, I'm not a photographer. I am someone who uses photographs to capture yes, things. Yes, that's me too. Yeah. I'm not a photographer. I, yeah. I really don't know much. I don't know much about photography. Oh, I haven't got a buddy clue either. I'm making it up as I go along. I don't know much about it. I just decide what I want to do and go, yeah. okay, how am I going to do this? Yeah. Right. I'm going to do it this way. Exactly. And, um, yeah. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> so, um, just earlier on, you were talking about pop culture, mm. your inspirations in pop culture. Mm. Can you tell us a bit more about some of the your prime influences? Well, I grew up on like seventies BBC sci-fi, yeah, and these are guys who had the same budget to make a sci-fi spaceship epic as they would have to make Last of the Summer Wine. Yeah, and. <laughs> So you look at these things and, and you can see that some 
anonymous person has been set the task of make this monster with a ray gun and a spaceship and the stars. You've got five minutes and two quid. And I love seeing the practical elements that people have done. I, I, I love it even more when you just catch a glimpse and you figure out the, you, you see a little bit behind the curtain. Yeah. Um, even you're like, oh, that's the top of a dishwasher bottle. That's exactly yeah. it. I, I, because I love sci-fi, I, I grew up and, and, and I always maintain it because my, my, my mother had two shelves of books so the sci-fi was low and above that was, you know, Terror, um, Lord of the Rings, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And my sister was three years older than me, so she could reach the top shelf and I could reach the bottom shelf. So I read sci-fi, she read um, um, fantasy. But I've loved sci-fi from from day one, Doctor Who, uh, Blake Seven, Terrorhawks, Thunderbirds, all that sort of stuff. And so, and I, I digest a lot of that sort of pop culture. Yeah. And I, I, I like sort of being part of it. There's, there, there's a, you love something so much you want a piece of it and and so I like making things that are homages to the shows I like that and I, oftentimes you'll, you'll see you have that moment when you go I know how you did that and I'll take that trying to mimic something and that teaches me how to do things and then I'll take that knowledge and then I'll make something for myself so every second thing I make is an attempt at solving someone else's riddle it's like trying to do a crossword puzzle and then when you figure out and then, and then what I've learned with that like the new vocabulary I've learned I'll then apply that to making something for myself and so that's kind of how a lot of my work has, has evolved. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because yeah. there's, I mean, there's, there's, there's um, films such as uh, films like Hardware, The Mad Max I knew films. you were going to say Hardware. Uh, I, I love Hardware too. <laughs> and Watching that, that that film and you're sort of looking at it really closely and going, that's a really clever robot, but then you, I can't remember what element it is. You see one little thing and you go, oh, I, 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 I recognize that thing. Yeah. Uh, I think for a lot of people who watch Star Wars, they, they watch Liam Neeson hold up what was actually a lady's razor blade, uh, a razor without the, the top, was the, the hand piece for a, a lady's shaver. That was his communicator. And people just caught that and went, oh my God. And a lot of people complain that pulled them out at the moment, but it put it put it in reality for me. It was a set. Admire the fact that this is a this is a production, and and respect the the, the people who had to do that. When you think that. about the prop makers, and they've gone, oh, this this would make a, a really good communicator, wouldn't that's it? That's exactly yeah. it. Yeah, and I, that's the kind of thing I do as well. I see something and go, oh, I reckon I can use this for something. Yeah. Ah. I mean, that, that's I mean, half my inspiration is just seeing something and going, you know what? That might be an interesting if you turn it upside down, turn it sideways. Yeah. That's why I love haunting two dollar shops because you just wander around. Yes. And and you just go, that's an interesting thing. I wonder what it would look like with this, 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 and this. And that's so. I mean. Some things I get inspired by seeing something go. I, um, I love um, there's some computer games by uh, groups like Bethesda and, and Obsidian. Um, the Fallout games. There's yep. a more recent one called Outer Worlds. I love these games so much. I made costumes out of the games. I became it's, it's not art. It's cosplay. Mm. Even though I don't go out and wear them, I just I, it was a way of sort of enjoying that world a little bit longer and making it a, a piece of, of 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 mine almost. So it's like laying claim to it. Yeah, uh, but, I get that. But in a better way than I, mean, I own animation cells in my favourite film called a film called Wizards, mm. and I've owned the cells. But I'm more proud of where I have used that as inspiration for like painting and, and, and such forth like that. The work I've made from it has a more honest sort of fandom than just owning a piece of it because the, the owning it is just money and connections. Yeah. But the thing I made, I'm like, this is my yeah, that's my homage. your connection yeah. to the thing that you love. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really nice. Mm. Um, are there any kind of real life experiences that have specifically influenced your work or piece of work? Yeah, actually there was a, 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 almost an experiment I did. Um, I get take some quite fun drugs to deal with um, narcolepsy uh, and I found that there were one particular friend in particular um, particularly, I'm going to say that yeah, yeah, far too yeah, many yeah. times, but um, uh, used to nag me to share my drugs. Mm. And I, they gave the impression that A, they did not actually believe I needed them. They thought I'd scammed the uh, neurologist into giving me these prescriptions. Um, and also, despite the fact I needed these things to, for example, drive a car, operate heavy machinery, um, do my job, they were like, well, we want some because we can have fun on these drugs. And I'm, I'm not having fun on these drugs, but. I got nagged and I didn't want to be too confrontational about it um, but I did end up sort of being a bit sour on this person and I was stuck trying to think 
I, I, I sort of came up with this idea, this, this passive aggressive almost. I wanted to try, try and explain to them what I was going through. I felt I'm obviously not communicating this well. You, I can tell people what's going on. It's not getting through. And I went, well, I have, what, what tools do I have in my arsenal? And I have, I went, well, I'll try and tell this. Can I create a piece of art that explains what it's like to go through um, this sort of a grand mal seizure, mm. this um, having a narcoleptic attack, whatever term you want to call it, um, a bout of idiopathic hypersomnia, if yeah, you will. Yeah, yeah. And so it, I'm, and, and, and it started off as this slightly sort of dickish idea of I'm, I'm, I'm going to show them and they're going to say sorry. But it became an interesting challenge, this idea of can I create what is a purely internal neurological experience in art and I went okay well we'll take the gloves off we're not going to pretend that this is going to be a photo project mm -hmm. I'm going to use everything in my arsenal because you're trying to create something that is not physically tangible mm -hmm. and so I was working with photography illustration sculpture costuming steed computer generated things just going around in huge circles of there were things that were printed out torn up made into collages re-photographed restructured keep trying to make things into this almost like a dream state yeah. and because it was it is very much a sort of a, a meant to be a, a slightly dreamy disconnected state i worked in a very strict palette i didn't instead of using lots of color i i stripped it all back to my roots of black and white um because they're, they're also complimented using using illustration whatever because I'm, I'm i'm a pen and ink kind of boy and so everything had a had a homogenous color scheme it was black and white but everything was given a slightly blue tint which is something i'd experienced mm. um which i believe is one of the side effects of taking viagra as well you get a blue tint in your eyes but either way um it was just wanted this quite cold uh, because it was also quite a it was a depressing thing it was it was something that i was internal to me something i would dealt with for 20 years actually having to take a look at it and initially it started off as going i'm going to tell people about this harmless thing and the more I looked at it the more I went man this actually does suck uh, <laughs> it, it really does but it created some of the most interesting and personal works I've ever done and this because it was to do with me alone I couldn't use anyone else one it was personal two it was very negative and if I used friends in works that were about pain and suffering and me being a miserable little bastard I, I felt that was I didn't want to tie my friends to that mm. um, and they couldn't really express what you were what you were dealing with anyway. True, but this is even just using people as meat props. Yeah. If, if I because you know part of of of, of narcolepsy is um, sleep paralysis and you get yeah. black hag hallucinations and yeah. I did and later wanted to to you know demonstrate what that would be but I didn't want to make a, a friend Being a nightmare. A hag. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> that, that seemed seemed a bit rude and so I did it solely on my own um, with no grand intention of doing anything and I finally collected the whole work. And then this sat on it, and I briefly showed it to my wife, and she went, "Well, that's pretty." Uh, she liked it, jolly good, or, or at least respected it. It's, it's a bit horrifying, but I also I, I learned from that. I, ne I never did show it to the, um, the the person who pissed me off. But I also realised I'm not doing this for anyone else. I could do this. I could spend six months of my time doing this very personal thing, and then put it to one side and go, "We're done." And I didn't show anyone it because I didn't want to share what became slightly almost too personal for a while I didn't feel the need to shove it down people's throats mm. and that's when I realized I don't need to share everything I do I'm doing it for the joy of doing it and I, I came out of the other side better than I'd gone into it because I, I ended up with both from the art perspective and realizing what the hell I go through I was like oh, I respect myself a bit more it's like wow man I, I deal with some some tough stuff and uh, and survive and like yay yay me I, I, but yeah it was it was it was an an interesting project and I, I've kept that in the back of my mind since I've done a few other things where I have tried to express things or you know if not express for other people then to imbue certain feelings and ideas into the work almost to get them out of my head because it seemed it was quite useful to take something that was unstructured and this weird idea in the back of my head and actually pin it down if not for anyone else then for me it's it helped me process it and understand it it gave a face to something that was at that point faceless um, I think it, it possibly is interesting and helpful for other people too like I also suffer from sleep paralysis and so seeing other people's depictions of it is um, it's quite 
I guess it's probably quite helpful for me because it's such an intangible thing. It's not something you can you can really explain. Mm. So you can only get the feeling of it across perhaps through other media, mm. um, visual media or, or even maybe even sound media, something mm. like that. But it would be, because it's such an idea, it's such a um, uh, sort of individual and, and quite isolating thing, I do like the idea that someone could look at that and go, oh, he understands, they understand. Yeah, I know then, what that is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, exactly. It's like, I can't sleep on my back. Because oh, okay. I'll get sleep paralysis. Oh. Yeah. I can't sleep on your back either. But, yeah. No, well, I mean, you could try, but you'd probably get sleep paralysis. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. That was far too serious. What else have we got to talk about? Yeah. Um, oh, I know. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your process? And, for example, you know, if you have a time of the day that you like working, or if you have a state of mind, or if you're like me and you just push through, <laughs> no matter how bad you're feeling about uh, it. I, I, <laughs> I learned a long time ago not to push through because if I if you take sort of uh, if I take a negative idea into something even if the outcome's okay it's kind of tainted mm. um, and I won't enjoy the final result much as same with a, say if I've taken a picture um, and there was a, I can't think of which picture it was particularly but the, the the model had later said oh I was really uncomfortable that was really painful and, and, and I wasn't I, I'm, I'm happy that you're happy but they weren't oh that's yeah I don't like that I, and I couldn't oh, use the picture after yeah, that. I was no. like because then I look at that picture and go oh we're not all having fun together, and, and but they, they they thought it was worthy, and I was just like, oh gosh, no, this is not worthy. You know, it's, I don't want that either. If yeah. I'm putting people in uncomfortable situations, I want them to be enjoying it. Absolutely. So, like uh, Josie, uh -huh. loves it. <laughs> it. It's useful having having perverts yeah. for friends. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I, I don't push through. I but I do. Uh, I, I get my evenings to myself. My, my dear lady wife is, is, is a far more adult person than me. She rises with the dawn, looks after the dogs, exercises, <laughs> gets out the door. I fall out of bed and crawl to work. But she's also sensibly in bed with, um, you know, with a good book by about nine. And I don't go to bed until you know, after midnight. So I get three hours. It's dark. The world has gone to sleep. The dogs are asleep. I'm in my little space. There's no one around. And that's when I can let my mind run free for want of a better term. That's, yeah. that's when I get to work and I have no obligations. I can't, I can't, even if there's something I needed to do, I can't be like, oh, I should, I should be probably doing the dishes or vacuuming the floors. You can't do that because you know, the, I leave the house alone and I just, I, I have my space and I'm quiet and I work here. And so I always have this option and I don't always necessarily go, ha, ah, this is the time, you know, because I've got the time, I have the, uh, the, the urge, but I do have tools to sort of get warmed up because uh, you know, yeah, I might go, because oh, there's always something to do. There's about half a dozen projects lying yeah, around waiting to yeah. be done. And sometimes I look at them all and just go, it's like you're opening the fridge and go, I, nothing here satisfies. Or your wardrobe, oh, I've got nothing to wear. Exactly. Which is why I've always had a few sets of Lego to hand because oh. I'll, exactly. You're uh, a man after my own heart. Yeah, because yeah, you might sit down and put on a TV show and go, oh, no, no, I don't want to be watching a TV show. And I'll fall asleep anyway. But I'm not really yet ready to use my sort of creative brain. So I'll just like, oh, here's a Lego set. Here's some instructions. And you start working with that. Russell, Russell, build, build. And that sort of almost gets everything sort it of warmed up. It gets everything ticking over. It, yeah. it's, it's like a warm up before yeah. a workout. Exactly. And, and so, having yeah. the instructions yeah. is actually really good because you don't have to think about what you're making too much. You're exactly. just making it. It's the process of the making yeah. and your brain starts going, oh yeah. yeah. And so that gets me sort of into that creative mindset yeah. and having fun and it's all colourful and noisy and, and you get moving. And then it's like, okay, now I'm going to do something for myself. Yeah. So I'll, I'll always have at least an hour a night of working on something. But yeah, sometimes I do have to sort of build up the momentum. Uh, and sometimes I'm just going, well, actually, no, I, one more. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, one more. This is going to be. So suddenly I'll, I'll, be, I'll be sitting there like it's midnight. I've got a Lego house in front of me going, I'm sure I was going to do something else tonight. But uh, then we have tomorrow night. So it all works out. Yes, I, I also use Lego as a sort of interesting form of creative therapy hmm. of actually just getting your brain, yeah, warmed up. Yeah. Get it ticking over a little bit. Yeah, because yeah. it's, it's creative without having, to, but I mean, I, I find like the blank page to always to be a bit intimidating. Yeah. You depend on the blank page. I, um, I, I always draw on a lined page if I'm if I'm sketching. Oh. Because I don't like a, I don't like I like it to have lines because then there's mm -hmm. something on it. No, oh, because that's the other problem. You, you want regular feedback. Um, if you're working on something that's going to take a month and yeah. day by day there's no change, there's no sense of accomplishment and so that can become quite tiring. So it's nice to have something to hand that even if it is just assembling a little 
vehicle, you can sort of go, well, I've I, done I a made thing. this. Yes. yes, I've got a project like that on at the moment, which is a slow moving number. And um, I, I like to have other little things to mm. work on, well, like YouTube videos, for example, mm. so that I feel that I'm, I'm still keeping moving and mm. doing something when I've got this big project yeah. underway, which is taking a lot of sort of time in the background. Mm. Yeah. Actually, I've got too many projects underway at the moment, to be honest. <laughs> I, I have projects in different states. Sca different <laughs> states, but different scales as yes, well. Yes, yeah, yeah, because there's so, the small scale ones, yeah. they're quite doable. And then there's mm. your, your big, this is going to take the year, isn't it? Kind yeah, ones. yeah. Because yeah. uh, one, one question. Peeking behind the curtain, Mary actually sent me a couple of questions that she thought I might want to answer. Yeah. And one of them was about dream, dream projects. Yes. And I do have two, which are year-long projects, both requiring me to learn new skills. Oh, that's a whopper, that is. It is. Yeah. One was a photo project. It was a collaboration with aforementioned Josie. And she had a very good idea. She had a different interpretation of a sculpture to how I saw it. She saw something else in it. I, I'd made something and it had meaning and purpose. And she saw it and went, well, I, I, I see it as something else. And she told the tale about it. And this was a fascinating tale. And it became... We tried to look at it as a, a series of photos, but it proved to be, it had to be a short, it was a short story, it was a short film. And I'm not good at film. The idea is good, the, the, the concepts are there, but not, that's not the first film I want to make. I've, I've done little things with cameras, but that was like, I need to be able to organize it. And of course, it's at a level that to do this properly, it's not just going to be two people in a room. I need mm. colleagues and I need staff. And so to justify them, you want to be able to say you're doing it well. So I have to learn how to do the stuff so that I'm not wasting anyone's time. Yes, I, this is my problem as well, and not wasting go. anyone's time thing. Yeah. Yeah. And the other project is actually about writing because I love the idea. I mean, I mentioned these are props to a film that wasn't made. I've always liked the idea of making... Um, Somewhere between Jodorowsky's Dune and House of Leaves. So, uh, so not not um, a small thing at all then. Not at all. <laughs> I, I love the idea of writing the book about the film that didn't exist because I've got enough things oh, to fake. Oh, that's an, a oh, real film. Yeah. You can show all the costuming. You can show all the background stuff to suggest this film existed and vanished. Mm. And House of Leaves is, is about that. That's quite a serious and scary book about book, it. Yeah. It is. Um, and so sometimes I keep thinking of it, I, yeah, sometimes I'm like, I want to create this work, which is uh, a multimedia one. I like the idea of having like found footage of, you know, like a video of a screen of the one trailer that might have been shown, just to really sort of fake it out a little yeah, bit, that's, Blair that's Witchy. Right, yeah. But depending on which mood I'm in, sometimes I'll try writing things up. Sometimes I'm going for um, Spinal Tap and sometimes I'm going for House of Leaves. And I'm not, I'm not good, I'm not funny enough to make it a comedy and I'm not, good enough to make it serious so it's trying to find that tone so I'm having to learn how to write and mm -hmm. figure what lane to go in. I, I guess darkly comic is where it will end up but it's everything is in place except the ability to actually tell that story in a way that's going to waste you know someone's going to read 50 pages of writing I, 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 I'm not I haven't got the skill yet to waste that much time for someone else. So that's that's the other sort of dream project that I'm working on. That sounds yeah. great. It, 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 that it's does, fun. that sounds great, um, yeah. To the point that one person has suggested actually write, doing a short film about someone who discovers the book, because it's about a science, it would be about presumably a post-apocalyptic zombie hunting thing, who liked the idea of people on a, making a film about people on a trek to find the director of the film during a zombie apocalypse, because at that point, this, you know, they've, they've seen the documentary and they go, this guy's got a shed full of weapons. And so they like the idea of doing a pilgrimage to find the props from this non-existent film to use in the zombie apocalypse. And so this was a rather drunken discussion I had with a friend, but it did become this sort of lay up on lay up on lay up on lay. But it and starts with the here, book. And they find your weapons aren't real. They're all plastic. Well, what they find is that the weapons are real, but I'm a zombie. Have you thought about, if you wanted to take it down a spooky route, you could do the haunted tape? Roach, you could do the people that discover the tiny clip of the movie or the tiny clip of the trailer for the movie and they want to find the whole thing and but there's something wrong with it. And this is the thing that it, it's a fun stepping off point because it it's the book would encompass a huge swathe of what I've done over the past however many years uh, and present it in a way that I think is a good way of presenting the stuff. It's not trying to 
do, you know, I, I talk about not wanting to be overly professional in the way I, I, I light stuff. It makes sense to have things looking a little bit rough and ready because these are these fake photos that were taken on a set of a film that was being made in a strange location by weird people. Yeah, with with a low budget. And, exactly. Yeah. So there, it's, it, it's it's this weird er uh, project that captures everything that I've I've done and will do. So thank you for joining Richard and I today in his wonderful shed. Um, I hope you found this interesting and got some insight into the dark and <laughs> creepy mind of Richard. Yeah, the, I, I think the term you're looking for is Willy, the Willy Wonka Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, that seems pretty <laughs> accurate actually. Okay. <laughs> so thank you for joining us today and it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Oh, lovely to have you, have you here. Okay. Goodbye, Goodbye. Mary fans. <laughs>